And guys, grab a seat. Bring out your Bibles. Come on, bro. Great to be together this morning. Good morning to everyone. Wow. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, uh, I just want to welcome you here to, as part of our family. And everybody that's on Zoom as well, I want to thank you guys for joining virtually. Um, guys, turn over to Exodus chapter 1. Let's go, bro. Let's go, bro. We'll get into our, our scripture for the day. Mm. But, uh, you know, sometimes you ever get a phone call and and then you, you take out your phone. Where's my phone? No, right. where is it? Uh -oh. And you take out your phone, you look at it, you see who's calling, and then you ignore the call. You hear your phone ring and you know, and you're like, you hit the hater button. Oh. And, and you're like, I'm just not going to. I'm just not going to pick that one up right now. Oh. And you ignore the call. So, what about when God calls? Oh. The, title of my, the title of my lesson today is Answer the Call. Whoa! Answer the call. Don't hit the hater button on God. Because he'll just speak in a different way. Oh. He'll get your attention. You know, last week we uh, we studied out Joseph. We studied out Joseph. It was a it was a great lesson. We talked about Joseph the dreamer. The title of my lesson last week was "They Hated the Dreamer." And I talked about never making never making excuses or, or or never give up the dream that God has put on your heart. Never apologize for striving to do great things for God. And Joseph, he had, a, he had a great calling. And even though his life took some left turns and right turns, he stayed true to his faith. He stayed true to his calling and his integrity. And today we're going to look at another man with a great calling. We're going to look at the calling of Moses this Go morning. Moses. Yes. Because where the story of Joseph ends, the story of Moses begins. All right. okay. In Exodus chapter 1. In verse oh. 6. The Bible says, verse 6, it says, Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. They increased in numbers. And they became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And hopefully that describes our campus ministry in just a short time. Yes. Let's go, campus. It says, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies. They will fight against us and they will leave our country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses and as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more that they oppressed them, the more that they multiplied and they spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields and all of their harsh labor. The Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth and on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God, and they did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives, and he asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous. So they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives. And God's people increased. And they became far more, even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile River. Mm -hmm. But you can let every girl live. You know, you read this account, it's very 
powerful story. This is the start. This is the story of how Moses was brought into this world. And these were the times that Moses was born into. It says that the Egyptians, they hated the Israelites. They hated God's people. Long gone were the days where they were welcomed and Joseph was a hero. And now it says that the Egyptians, they were afraid. There's too many of the Israelites to count like stars in the sky. And so they started killing off or attempting to kill off the boys, throwing them into the Nile River was the, the call that went out. But just like stars in the sky that shine the brightest, that are the most visible during the darkest of nights, God works through these dark times and he raises up a prophet in Moses to lead God's people out of slavery. Mm. And that brings us to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, the birth of Moses Come during on, these dark times. Come on, bro. It says, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child with Moses in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, and she saw the baby, and he was crying, and she felt so sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. You now here we find, we find the birth of Moses. And from the very you know, start of his story, the odds were against him. Wow. He could have been killed from the very beginning, but he's you know thrown into the water and through it all, God had a plan. That should encourage all of us. Today. Oh, bro. Oh, bro. And the plan was much like Joseph, the saving of many lives. It says in Genesis 50, 20, you indeed intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives come on bro god works through the darkest of times you know i as i read the story of moses i thought about theo's story come on and theo has, has shared his powerful story before that long ago before he became a christian before his parents became christians you know and they were just dating they were young they became pregnant with their first child who would be theo look up theo but at that time they they thought you know we can't have this baby right now and so they decided to, uh, she decided, Theo's mother decided to get an abortion. Mm -hmm. And they went all the way to the medical facility to have the abortion. They're, they're, they're going to go through with it. And they're there, and they begin to show her pictures of, of you know, what would, this actually would entail. And she began to think about what she was doing, and she decided, we're not, we're going to have this baby. Mm -hmm. They were literally at the place to have the abortion. They were going to go through with it. In the last, literally in the last minutes, they decided to not go through. Come on. And thank God because we have Theo today. Yeah. The entire time, God had a plan. God had a plan for Theo, but he had a, a plan for the saving of many lives. Since that one decision, not only did Theo, Theo's father and mother become disciples, become Christians, Theo's become a Christian, but 24 people in their family wow. have become disciples. God always has a plan. It's encouraging Moses' story. His name means drawn out of the water. Literally, God saved him out of the water. That's what his name means. And then he was given a great calling to lead God's people out of slavery. And I say Mo the calling of Moses is no different than your calling. Right, come on, bro. Us too, at your baptism, were drawn out of the water. Oh. You were drawn out of the water to live a new life. And God placed a purpose and a calling 
that he gave you to lead his people or to lead all people out of slavery, just like Moses. Wow, wow. wow. And like Moses, <laughs> with dark times come great callings. Wow. And the darkest of hours comes the opportunity for God's people to shine the brightest. And I believe right now we are living in those times. I believe that we are living in dark times where sin is rampant, where hatred and distrust are apparent at every level, and depression and hopelessness is on the rise. Times where God's people are even greatly persecuted, where Christianity in the eyes of the world is equated with hypocrisy. And I believe that at these times, it's where disciples have the opportunity to shine the brightest, like stars in the sky, like Moses rose to shine bright. And it's time for us to live up to the calling, to on, answer bro. the call, and to live with the calling that we have received. Amen. Let's keep reading Moses' story in verse 11. Of chapter one two. Oh, bro. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. See, he knew that these were his people. So obviously his mom, even though he was in Pharaoh's household, his mom told him the stories of who he was. Wow. It says he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that way. You see, no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? (laughs) Then Moses was afraid. (laughs) He thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. So Moses ran from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. You know, Moses, he he grows up, and he obviously is taught of who he is. And because he knows who his people are, the Israelites, one day he sees one of his fellow men being mistreated by an Egyptian. And he has this passion that, that rises up inside of him to save his people. And he gives in the wrong way. Amen. And he didn't control that passion. He didn't handle it in the most righteous of ways that he kills a guy. Amen. That was not the plan. Okay, That was his plan. That's Amen. when you don't control your emotions. You have to right. wow. okay. But what was true was he had a passion. To save his fellow man and to save his people. And he kills this guy and it becomes known. And Pharaoh tries to kill him. And so he gets afraid and he runs away. And so for the next 40 years, he's on the run. And he wanders and he becomes a shepherd, living really as a slave to his past. But God still worked. And he found a way to reach Moses through a burning bush. You know, I read a quote this week. We are products of our past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. Right. You don't have to be a prisoner to your past. Even though you make mistakes, we've all made mistakes. There's all things like Moses we wish we could take back. Amen. But even though we are a product of our past, we've been molded, we've been shaped by the mistakes that we have made in the past, it doesn't have to dictate your future. Right. You don't have to live as a slave or a prisoner to your past. God wasn't done with Moses yet. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with me yet. That encourages me. Our past molds us, but it doesn't define us. And we're surely not prisoners of it. Come on, bro. Let's look at the very moment that God calls Moses. My first point, embrace your calling. Let's go, bro. And I do have a subtitle to this point. Uh, Excuses, excuses, excuses. (laughs) But I thought that was too negative. So that's just my subtitle. (laughs) But the title of the point is Embrace Your Call. Excuses, excuses, excuses. (laughs) Let's look at Moses' calling in Exodus 3 and verse 1. Moses, he's on the run. He's out wandering. He's the shepherd. Maybe he thought, okay. Is God going to use me? I I mean, I'm just a shepherd now. My life is over. I don't know what he thought. But God gets his attention one day. In Exodus 3, verse 1. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. 
And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. You see, no matter how fast and how far you run, how fast he ran, he still came to the mountain of God. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, you know, that brought me, you know, no matter how far or how hard you try to run from God, you're eventually going to get to the point where you have to make a decision to walk up the mountain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when we lived in Colorado, which I call the land of many mountains, <laughs> <laughs> the Rocky Mountains. I mean, you don't get much better than that. No, and we used to go to this place <laughs> called Breckenridge. <sighs> and uh, Breckenridge was uh, my favorite places in all of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's located at the base of the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. And the Rockies are like 14, 15, 16,000 feet elevation. Okay? Wow. Like way up there. And the town of Breckenridge itself is 10,000 feet elevation. Just so you know, Detroit, 600 feet. <laughs> <laughs> 600 like sea level, basically. Wow. Breckenridge, 10,000 feet. In fact, the, the highest mountain, if you even want to call it a mountain in Michigan, is in the upper peninsula. It's the Huron Mountain, mm. 1,900 feet. Wow. Okay, I lived on a, on a place called Razor Mountain, and I didn't think of it as a mountain, and that's 2,000. It's even higher than the highest place in Michigan, wow. okay, so where I grew up in Oregon. Well, wow. And we used to go to Breckenridge and we'd go to these little shops, which we like to do. And there was this sign that we saw one time that said, the mountains are calling. Wow. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mountains are calling. And I've always wanted to go back to the mountains. And always, you know, it's so true. The mountains are calling. But right here, the point that I want to make to us is no matter how fast you can run and how far you run, the mountain of God will always be called. Come on, and you gotta make the decision to walk up the mountain mm. and go walk with the king of glory. Come on, bro. It says in verse two, it says, There the angel of the Lord, right? At the, at, the, at the mountain of God, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'm gonna go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to take a look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing. is holy ground. Stop it. So here we got Moses. He's out one day and he sees a burning bush that it doesn't burn up. And he's like, hmm. That's a strange sight. This bush isn't burning up. It's just on fire. And so he goes over and he's taking a closer look at this strange sight. And it says that he hears God's voice come from within the burning bush. Moses. That would freak you out. <laughs> and he says it twice. Moses. And so that really got his attention. God knows how to get your attention. And God can speak to you in many ways. I remember... I remember, <laughs> I've got to share with you my story. And I know many have heard the story, but some of you have not. But many years ago, before I became a disciple, um, I was living in San Francisco. I was in the military. And uh, I was uh, on leave, and I was in Oregon. And I decided, you know, I stayed for 30 days. I partied the whole time. And then I got in my car, and I headed back to where I was stationed in San Francisco, California. And I'm driving in my car. I began to fall asleep at the wheel at about midnight. I stayed way too late in Oregon, and I'm on the drive on what's called the freeway. It's called I-5. I'm going 80 miles an hour. I set my cruise control to 80 miles an hour in my car. And I'm driving down the road. I fall completely asleep at the wheel. When I fall asleep, I veer. I pull down on the steering wheel. My car veers across all the lanes of traffic. I hit a bridge. We talk about being drawn out of water. I hit a bridge. I flipped my car end over end over the bridge and land in a lake and my car sinks and I'm underwater and I turn I remember turning to my left because all my windows had bursted I didn't know it but I turned to my left to, to try to open the door so I don't even know what I was thinking but the water just came gushing in in that moment and it was coming up over my head so quickly that I had to take an immediate emergency breath 
and I only got half a breath. I swallowed half of it as water and it went over my head. Now I'm in the darkness, completely underwater, contemplating my existence. Like, this is it. I don't have time to like gather myself. I've got to get out of this car. And I even forgot how to take a seatbelt off. I was so panicked. Anyways, you know, to make a long story short, God helped me get out of that car without, with, with barely a scratch, no broken bones on me. I, I swam to shore, stood up on that bridge, looked at everything, my life, everything I owned was in that car. Everything was gone in a moment, wow. contemplating eternity, knowing I wasn't right with God. And then I get taken to the hospital. They released me. No one can believe I survived it. And then the next morning, I go back to the place where I was stationed. I go back to my, my ship now without a car and figuring out, like, what am I going to do? And, and really, I was thinking about where am I going to spend eternity? God just got my, you want to talk about a burning bush? <laughs> God just got my attention. <laughs> but then that got my attention. But then I heard God's voice. And here's what happened. I'm down there by myself. I turned the TV on. I, 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 I'm recovering at this point. And the, the movie that was on when I turned the TV on was a movie called Hellraiser, uh -uh. which described my life. <laughs> this movie, Hellraiser, the scene that, you want to talk about God picking the time and places, the scene that was on, this, this demonic figure in the movie who they call Pinhead, he walks into a church, walks down an aisleway just like this, walks to the altar, faces the camera. I felt like he's like looking right at me. I'm like freaking out you know? <laughs> and he looks at me and he takes these pins out of his head and he puts them into his hands like he's jesus on the cross and he says jesus wept and he starts laughing mocking the cross and i was like whoa right <laughs> it's like everything like my whole like everything i got walleye vision like <laughs> time slowed down and it scared me even though i wasn't a christian i just felt this darkness and I turned the TV up. <laughs> for but sure. right when I, for sure, I've never watched <laughs> that movie since. I've never watched that movie since. That movie. <laughs> no way. I turned that TV, I turned the TV up, and there was a Bible sitting underneath the TV. Oh, bro. This is my burning bush moment. Okay? <laughs> and the Bible was sitting there, and I just grabbed it, and I kind of looked around. It wasn't my Bible. I didn't know who it was. I didn't even know where to turn. So I just opened one time. Just like that. The holy flip. Right. <laughs> and I turned to Jeremiah chapter 7. If you're visiting today, my name is Jeremiah. Oh. <laughs> I turned to Jeremiah 7. I kid you not, this is how Jeremiah 7 verse 1 starts. These are the words that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Wow. And then I stopped reading. <laughs> I stopped reading because I didn't know about I didn't know, man. I didn't know. What is this going to say? I like, literally thought, like, I want to keep reading. Right now. And it went on. He says, Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live. <laughs> that was crystal clear. I was like, right. <laughs> And then it goes on. It says, It says, I want you to stand at the gates of my house and proclaim my word. Mm. And at that time, I didn't even know what that part meant. Mm. The other part, you need to change. I got that. <laughs> And I and God put disciples in my life. I changed. I became a Christian just a short time later. It was really awesome. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> understand the other part of that scripture. God was calling me. That was my call. I didn't even realize. <laughs> He said, I want you to stand and proclaim. Did you ever do it and get the money? If you what, what's wrong with you? What my Are you top crying? 100 jobs would have been at that time? <laughs> country. <laughs> Being a minister Why wouldn't even crying? make the list. Wow. <laughs> it wouldn't even come into my <laughs> Not at all. So the fact that I'm here today proclaiming God's message come on, Jeremiah. is a miracle. <laughs> Speaking to you. Oh, no. Well, because he is. Maybe it's not through a burning bush. Maybe it's not through a car accident. Maybe it's maybe it's not through a movie. But he is speaking. Yeah. Are you listening? In Job 33, verse 13, the Bible says, God speaks again and again. Though people do not recognize him. He'll speak to you in dreams, in visions of the night. 
when deep sleep falls on people or they lie in their beds or when they lie in their beds, he whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes them turn from wrongdoing and he keeps them from pride. Wow. The Bible says here that God speaks one way, now, now another. God can speak in many, many different ways. He says, let's speak through a dream. I got up this morning, you know, I was having a quiet time. Then later on, uh, Zalma gets up. She's down there making coffee. She goes, I had a dream. She tells Zalma, goes, I'm mad at you. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? I had a dream about you last night. And she goes, in my dream, you were sending me to another church, and you said you have to go buy your going away present, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> I don't know why she had it. Paul says, God speaks to you in dreams. Keep, oh. you, keep you from pride. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why you have it. No, God will speak to you in many ways. God will speak to you through health challenges. Oh. God spoke to me through a movie, a worldly movie. God got my attention. Wow. God will speak to you through people. Even in the Bible, it says that God spoke to a man named Balaam through his donkey that he was riding. Yeah. Like he was so stubborn that God spoke to him through a donkey. The donkey literally turned and started speaking to the guy. <laughs> He's like, oh, I better stop before I'm doing it. <laughs> God speaks in many ways, though you do not perceive it. That means you're not aware of it. You know why you're not aware of it? Because you're not listening. Hey. You don't want to hear God's voice. You don't perceive it because you're not trying to hear God's voice. An amazing thing happens when you open up your ears to God's voice. You'll hear his voice in many ways. Through many many different places and people you start hearing his voice all the time you'll watch a movie and you're like i think god is speaking to me right now i think god's trying to get my attention in isaiah 30 verse 19 you can just write this passage down the bible says people of zion who live in jerusalem you will weep no more how gracious he will be when you cry out for help as soon as he hears he will answer you although the lord gives you the bread of adversity that's another way he speaks by the way and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. God speaks. Are you listening? How is God trying to get your attention today? Yeah. Why are you here? You think you just randomly got invited by somebody? Ooh. Are you listening today? Let's go back to Moses. In the oh, yeah. Let's go back to Moses in the burning bush. In verse 6 of Exodus 3. Are you listening? Come on. You got to listen before you answer the call. Oh. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Come on. So he sees the burning bush. God said that this ground is holy ground. You take off your sand. Verse 6, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was now afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites ha has reached me. And I've seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should look for Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You know, here Moses, he gets the call. And uh, he does not immediately embrace his calling. 
Instead, Moses brings up my subtitle, right? Excuses, excuses, excuses. <laughs> right. Moses brings up literally, and we're going to read the story. He brings up all of the excuses why he couldn't answer God's call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it shows you that God can move in incredible ways in your life, like a burning bush and a voice coming out of it. <laughs> and it shows you can see miracles. You, you can know God moved, but still make excuses when called. It's like, can you imagine God calling you? And you know it's God. And you're like, yeah, not right now. <laughs> And you hit pay your button on God, right? <laughs> or, or you just you just let that like that that pre uh, that pre uh, pre recording message just just let God listen to the pre recorded message. Right. Hey, this is so and so. I can't answer the call right now because oh. I'm too weak. Oh. 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 First excuse that Moses makes is, "Who am I?" What he's saying there is like, "Why me? You picked the wrong guy." Like I'm, I'm a nobody. It's the same thing that Gideon said when Gideon was called. Look, guy, he says this to the angel voice. He says, "Look, I'm the, I'm like the, I'm from the weakest clan. Let me say that, <laughs> and I'm also the weakest dude in my clan. <laughs> Are you sure you want to call me?" <laughs> And so the first excuse that we see Moses make here is the, the self-deprecating excuses. Mm. Okay. Mm. <laughs> God, <laughs> you shouldn't choose me. And then we have our list of reasons why God can't use us. Oh my gosh. And usually those reasons are like, I'm too young. I'm too old. <laughs> I got too much sin. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not strong enough. I don't know my Bible well enough. I'm not secure enough. And we say it. And we say those things, those excuses, like we're revealing some big mystery to God. <laughs> God, you gotta understand who I am here. And we list off our living excuses. God's like, dude, I already know that. <laughs> In fact, that's why I'm calling you. Wow. <laughs> Go to First Corinthians one for a second. Oh, you guys are like, yeah, I know that. I know you're weak in this area. I know you got that sin. I'm still calling you. Wow. In First Corinthians one. In fact, he doesn't call those who think that they're all strong and bad. Right? Yeah. You look at the Bible. God called some messed up people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's true. Look what he says here in 1 Corinthians 1 26. Then we're going to go back there to this point. So get your flipping fingers ready. 1 Corinthians 1 26 says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise. <laughs> not many of you were influential. And not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world. To shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Wow. So that no one can boast. Wow. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It brings more, it brings God way more glory. You shine way brighter when he takes a weak man, a weak woman, and he raises you up to be strong mm -hmm. and to do great things on, for him. Mm -hmm. I wrote down an analogy here, um, and I forget the analogy. <laughs> I, just called it, I called it the swimming pool analogy, and I don't know why I wrote that down. <laughs> I think of it, I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I just remember. <laughs> when something that is that is weak, it doesn't look like it should create something amazing, but when it does, it, it it's it's way more glorious. For instance, if 
you know, living in California where we once said, you see swimming pools all over the place and they don't really amaze you. Everybody's got a swimming pool. Right. And when someone builds a swimming pool with all their high tech equipment, and they, their excavators and all that stuff, it's like, yeah, big deal. But on YouTube the other day, I saw these guys that lived in the Amazon. Oh, yeah. Uh, exactly. And they, they had sticks. Yeah. And they, and they exactly. went and they dug out. They had no excavator. They dug out the space for a pool with, with sticks. And then they went and they, and they, they made their own cement. Wow. Right? Wow. And they made this pool, the swimming pool. And then they made like this cave area and all this amazing stuff. And I watched the whole video. And by the end, I'm like, that's incredible. <laughs> that's just amazing. Because they did it with inglorious things. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what's my point? Great analogy. Oh, yeah. wow. When God uses you to build something glorious, mm -hmm. but in and of ourselves, we're inglorious. We have all of our reasons why, and we have all of our excuses and all of our sin. But when he raises you up, even though, yes, we aren't strong enough, we're not smart enough. We're not anything enough, but God is. Yeah, come on, bro. And when he raises you up to do that, that brings him glory. Mm -hmm. That's why he chooses you when you're weak. To wait until you feel, and I say until you feel, because you'll never be strong enough. To wait until you feel strong enough, until you feel smart enough, capable enough, or deserving enough. Oh. Before you embrace your calling. That's just prideful. <laughs> and it shows how self-reliant you are. Ah. Okay, go to Exodus 4. <laughs> Exodus 4, verse 1. Let's go back to Moses. So, hey, if you feel weak, if you feel not strong enough, you feel all those things, that's a good spot to be in. <laughs> that's the best place to be in because you'll be even more glorious when God works through you. Wow. Wow. Exodus 4, verse 1. So Moses, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, he keeps going here. Verse one, Moses answered, well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? What if they say the Lord did not appear to you? <laughs> then the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? Let's get out. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, gave him a stake, and he ran from it. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside of his cloak. And when he took it out, his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back in your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into the cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign then may they believe the second one but if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you then take some water from the nile pour it on the dry ground and the water you take from the nile will become blood on the ground you know moses we'll stop there for a minute moses's uh second excuse was well, what if they don't believe me what if no one listens to me and God says to him, says, first, I'm going to perform a couple miracles. And if that doesn't work, and we know the first plague was the Nile turning into blood. He goes, if the two miracles, if they don't listen to the two miracles, then I'll send the plague. Maybe they'll listen to that. Can you hear me now, right? Remember the Verizon commercials? <laughs> and what's the lesson? God will get your attention first with the magnificent. And if that doesn't work, then he'll get your attention with a predicament. Oh. Oh. Let's go. Right? We say it again. Oh. God will first get your attention with the magnificent. Okay. And if that doesn't work, then he'll get your attention with a predicament. Oh. Come on, bro. But what was the lesson for Moses? The lesson for Moses was he wasn't in control of whether they believed or not mm. he wasn't responsible for that wow. he just needed to be a vessel that delivered the message wow. so what's the lesson for you and me wow. be an empty vessel wow. that speaks like god's word yeah. unapologetically but with love speak wow. his message don't base 
your effectiveness or your worth or your faith wow. on the response of people. Wow. That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit will convict. The Holy Spirit is working all the time. God is working on the hearts of man all the time. You don't have to worry about whether they believe or not. You just have to deliver the message. And that's all Moses had to do. In verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent. Neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and I'm slow of tongue. The Lord said to Moses, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak. And I'll teach you what to say. Wow. You know, Moses, he continues to throw out all of his excuses. He throws out all of his physical limitations of why he can't do it. I can't speak. I'm a bad speaker. Yet, Acts 7.22 says that Moses was both educated and powerful in speech. So either Moses was just really deceived and out of touch, or God gave him the talents that he needed. Either way, you don't have an excuse. It reminds me of a quote. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So stop making excuses. If God has called you, if God has called you and given you the opportunity, embrace your calling. Answer the call. Excuses will always be there for you. Opportunities won't. <laughs> Excuses will always be there. Opportunities won't. Maybe today the opportunity for you is just to accept the call to become a disciple and to get baptized. Come on, bro. Stop making excuses. Answer the call. Embrace God's call. Maybe that call is one day God will call you to the full-time ministry. Don't make excuses. Answer the call. All the excuses. And God, I gotta love God. Listen. God's like, I'm gonna vaporize this guy. He didn't do that. Let me hear you, Mo. Okay, Moses. I'll help you. I'll help you. But see, the excuses, none of them were the real reason. Because look what happens here. And it brings up a fact. Sometimes our excuses are just smoke screens for the real reason why we won't answer the call. Verse 13. Moses said, pardon your servant. Just please send somebody else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. See, God, he never got angry until Moses was like, okay, just, I don't want to do it. <laughs> just send somebody else. Sometimes we don't embrace our calling because it's easier to watch someone else do the work. <laughs> because, and here's the real reason why. Because we're selfish, wow. or we're stubborn, wow. or both. Come on, bro. We, we don't want to embrace the pain or the pressure associated with leadership wow. or responsibility. Wow. Wow. We don't want to face the persecution that comes when you take a stand for something. Come on, bro. And so we just say, just... I just don't want to do it. Mm. Just please. We say it politely. Please. <laughs> please send somebody else. <laughs> but you're really saying, God, no. Wow. I don't want to. I'm not willing to. Mm. I'm not going to. No, I'm, I'm a stubborn guy by nature. <laughs> so now I wonder why my kids are so stubborn. Yeah. And, then, and then I just look in the mirror. <laughs> in my sinful nature, I'm like as stubborn as they come. Mm. Amen. When I was like 12 years old, <laughs> my dad, you know, he'd given me a BB gun. Okay, I got to show the BB gun story. Oh, yeah. oh, man. And uh, it was wintertime like this. Everything was cold. All the all the, the windows of the house and the truck window that my dad's nice truck were frosted up, you know. And I had this great idea as I'm out shooting my BB gun in the, in the backyard. 
I wonder what would happen <laughs> if I shoot my dad's truck. <laughs> Just the canopy, the truck with the canopy windows. <laughs> now I knew what was gonna happen. <laughs> but I wanted to see it happen. <laughs> so so I, I, I raised the gun and I have a moment of clarity. And I have a moment of clarity like if I do this, if I shoot my dad's truck. Yep. And I crack his windows with my BB gun. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be in some kind of trouble. <laughs> I'm probably the worst spanking I've ever got in my entire life. And I thought all of that, and I thought, eh, I don't don't care. Care. <laughs> <laughs> and I shot it. I knew what was gonna happen. I weigh, I weighed the consequences. <laughs> And I still said, oh, okay. that, is, that moment of pleasure of shooting my dad's canopy, I took the spanking and he gave me the worst spanking I ever got. <laughs> the lesson is this pain comes with rebellion. You can't Ow. escape pain. We think Ow. that the pain of leadership, that's going to be, no, 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 the pain of rebellion is far worse. Oh. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't escape pain by refusing your calling. Wow. wow. And it's worse because it's pain with no purpose. Yeah. Oh, no. Wow. It's pain with no point. Wow. The pain and the pressure and responsibility that comes with embracing your calling, there's purpose in that. There's a, there's a point to that. When you embrace your calling, yes, it's going to be painful at times. Mm. But God does miracles through you. Mm. You know, I've been able to lead ministries in six states. I've planted three churches. Wow. Oh, it's right. painful at times. Yeah. Oh, moving, Come we've moved so many times, I can't even count. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been hard. <laughs> Leadership is painful. Yeah. Sometimes you're like, why do I do this? Yeah. <laughs> it's painful. Yeah. But it's glorious at the same time. Yeah. Oh, the purpose in the pain is that I've helped, and my wife have helped, and the people that we've discipled have helped hundreds mm -hmm. of people become Christians. Yeah. Come on. Literally, Come on, the saving of many lives, mm -hmm. wow. as yeah. it says in Exodus 50 or Genesis 50. And that's the that's the point and the purpose. I look around this room. That's all the purpose I need. Yeah. Oh, oh, the wow. people that become Christians. Wow, come on, the people that became Christians in Indianapolis mm -hmm. that are here with us. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Will. Yeah. Will. Yeah. Embrace your calling. This morning, I, that's my simple call to all of us. Embrace your calling. Come Answer. On, right. God's call. Listen to his voice. Be a dreamer. Come on. For God. Yeah. And to him be all the glory. Woo -hoo!